Thank you for watching this video. We would like to start off with a quick thank you to our annual sponsors. Our Gold Level sponsors, Geronimo Properties, Northmark, AEI Consultants, and EBI Consulting. Our Silver Level sponsors, St. James Real Estate Advisors, and May Property Management. We would also like to mention our charitable partner for 2022, New View Communities, a CDC organization promoting affordable housing in central Massachusetts. To find out how you can become a sponsor of the New England CCIM chapter, or to learn more about New View Communities, please feel free to visit our websites. There will be links in the description below. Greetings on behalf of the New England CCIM chapter. I'm Michael Chase, the chapter president for 2022. Today is the sixth video for 2022 in our Cree Expert Series, and we are very pleased to be joined by Brendan Meyer, the attorney at law and founder of the Meyer Law Group. Brendan is a subject matter expert when it comes to EB-5, and we are very pleased to have him with us today. Brendan, uh, why don't we start off with a quick introduction, and would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the invitation to um, discuss EB-5 with you and the rest of the New England CCIM chapter. So, um, you know, founder principal, Meyer Law Group, headquartered here in San Francisco, California, which is where I am today. We also have offices in San Diego, Charlotte, North Carolina, New York, and Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Um, we have been involved, I've been involved in the EB-5 space since 1998. Great. So tell us what is EB-5? So EB-5, you know, it, it, you can sometimes see articles in the popular press where they're discussing EB-5 as, oh, people buying U.S. citizenship. And it's a little bit of a crude mischaracterization. You know, the, it's an easy headline. It's an easy concept for people to, that, you know, to say, but it's not really what it's about. EB-5 requires, requires an investment. Right now, the investment amount is either 800000 or $1,050,000 of money that the investor has to prove is legally sourced and then make the investment into a project that creates jobs for US workers, um, you, which, are, which have a definition of either being US citizens or US permanent residents. And so this is, and at the end of the process, which takes it's a multi-step, multi-year process and very expensive one, results in not citizenship immediately, not even a green card immediately, but a conditional green card. Why conditional? Because that's how the US government comes back and verifies that the investor's investment met the job creation requirement laid out by the law. If the investor's investment created the 10 jobs it was supposed to, then they'll be granted full permanent residence. If their investment fails to generate the required number of jobs, then the investor and their family will eventually be deported from the United oh. States. So it's a pretty, it, it's a pretty serious, it's a pretty serious process. It's not just, I mean, yeah, there are countries in the world that yeah, you just show up with with cash or check and you write it, and then they at the end of the process they hand you a, a, a passport or a permanent residence card. EB five is not like that at all. Interesting. So um, my understanding is that the program was suspended for a little bit last year. Tell us a little bit about where is the program uh, as it sits today? So you're absolutely right. The, there's two types of EB-5 programs, actually really four, but two of them really are not worth discussion. No one does them. And so it's really you know, the so-called direct EB-5 program and the so-called regional center EB-5 program. So what's the difference between the two? So the direct EB-5 is for people, you know, individual entrepreneurs who want to try to start their own individual business and mm -hmm. leverage their investment in job creation to get a green card. Mm -hmm. The regional center program, which prior to its um, temporary suspension as of June 30th, 2021, was allowed for more pooled investment projects, larger, large scale investment projects. You know, there's some, some noteworthy ones, such as in, in, in the Boston area, the, the Four Seasons Hotel that opened, I believe, in 2018, 2019 timeframe. That had a 
significant portion of its capital stack was funded through EB-5 investors. Mm. Um, you know, the Hudson Yards mega project in, in Midtown, West in Manhattan, likewise had a significant portion of EB-5. So there's some significant um, real estate development projects out there that were funded, at least in part, through EB-5. So, you know, when the, when the original regional center law expired June 30th, 2021, there was disagreement within segments of the industry over what the new law should be, what the details should entail. Fortunately, those were finally, it took a lot longer than I think anyone in the industry um, thought or, or definitely would care to admit, but finally, finally, as of March 15th, 2022, the um, as a part of the budget, um, comprehensive budget bill signed by P President Biden, we saw finally the return of the EB-5 Regional Center Program. Okay, and then how long is that uh, new, the Regional Center Program good for now? So it's now good, we have a five-year extension, so it'll be good through, um, actually a little five plus years, so it's set to expire again, not until September 30th, 2027. Okay. So from the developer standpoint or the property owner standpoint, let's talk about that perspective first. Mm -hmm. um, EB-5, uh, it's kind of pitched as a way of getting some equity capital, raising equity capital a little cheaper than mm -hmm. from investors who are solely driven by investor level returns, because in a way, these people, they're getting another ancillary benefit, and that's a path towards citizenship. That's so. Correct. Um, what are, how does the program work for the developer? So developer, um, you know, as they, as they, let's just say a developer wants to build, I don't know, uh, a, a new Ritz Carlton in Boston, for example, or some sort of mixed use development project or some type, generally type of real estate, um, construction related project. We can talk about the reasons why most EB-5 projects trend in that direction, but basically you need to sit down and think through your capital stack. You know, what is, how much, how much capital do we need to build this particular project? Okay, it's a hundred million dollars. Okay, how much developer equity um, can we put in? Okay, 20 million, what other capital sources? And then once, once you kind of analyze the numbers, look and see, okay, is there a, is this a type of project that would be attractive to EB-5 investors? Is it in a designated high unemployment area and thus qualifies for the $800,000 amount? Um, is it a project that investors overseas would understand? I mean, for example, you know, overseas investors understand what a, four, what a Four Seasons Hotel is. I mean, it's pretty easy or you know, high-end, high-rise condo, whatever it is. And more importantly, like, do you need, when do you want, well, obviously you, you always want money sooner rather than later, but when do you actually need the EB-5 capital? If you need it today to break ground, then EB-5 is not appropriate for you. If you need it tomorrow to improve, you know, to level the dirt, it's not for you either. If you need it, say six to nine, months from now when you know you've already started vertical construction and you know potential investors can come and see tangible progress with their own eyes then it's probably more fitting for you so almost look at eb5 a lot of developers look at it as a late stage mez piece you know that's the primary thing so coming in toward toward the end to really push things over the line um, other developers uh, look at EB-5 as a way to pay off bridge loans. That's permissible in EB-5 as well. So if a, so if a developer has a high interest construction loan, um, you know, maybe bring an EB-5 to retire that, maybe retire some expensive equity as well. Those generally tend to be the four, um, four reasons why I develop or the four uses of EB-5 capital. And you mentioned, you know, at a, at a basically money at a cheaper interest rate. Um, so that's, you know, subject to most EB-5 financing 
all in uh, comes out to it's basically structured as as a loan in the five to six percent range. So you know, in a low interest rate environment, that was maybe not necessarily as as attractive. But interest rates are tr are trending in the upward direction and probably will be for some time. So um, EB five will become more attractive. To developers because that five to six percent is really not dependent that you kind of pay out everyone for an EB5 deal. It's not really dependent on general overall interest rates. It is what it is. And so whether it's being used to replace equity or late stage MES, or you know, you can start seeing more possibilities for the EB5 raise. Now it should be noted too that in the same way that if you need EB-5 to, to break ground tomorrow, um, based upon market, you know, what the investors are now looking for and kind of you want to keep um, sufficient, we haven't talked about job creation yet, but you want to create, you don't want EB-5 to be too big, big of your, part of your deal. It makes the job creation requirements um, diff more difficult to prove and it makes investors uneasy. So numbers vary, but... I mean, if EB-5, you probably wouldn't, even for top tier deals, you probably wouldn't want EB-5 to be maximum 30% and 30% of your capital stack at most. So when you say you know, 30%, are you talking, how high can it get to? Uh, if you have, say your typical construction loan uh, lending up to 65%, can EB-5 take you plus 30 and take you to 95%? Or does it really yeah, max absolutely. out? It can. Okay. It can. Yes. So that would be capital stack. So your construction loan is 65, 65% mm -hmm. of your capital stack. Assuming the job's going to, you know, you could do 30% uh, EB5 and then, you know, 5% of something else. Now, you know, some of the investors are saying, well, we want more developer equity to deal, bump that up to 10. So now the EB5 becomes 25%, you know, that's fine. And if the developer is successful and they still have, you know, additional interest in, you know, investors, you know, if the, if the uh, offering is structured properly, you can always have a supplemental raise as long as, um, you know, you lay out the conditions for that in advance and there's sufficient job count for it. So, yeah, I mean, there's been projects out there that's, that's uh, you know, one in particular I can think of that, you know, wanted to start raise, set a hundred million to start and because of market conditions and everything, raised well north of 100 million um, because they, they built that contingency into their offering. And then they used that, um, the additional raise to yeah, retire, the, retire the construction loan. Interesting. So we're talking about the best use case in terms of timing for the funds to come in. When, I, when we think of a development cycle and the various stages within a development cycle, you have the acquisition of raw land and then you, the entitlement of the raw land and you get your building permits and your approvals and then you do your groundbreaking and construction as you said and then you have your completion of construction and then into stabilization and then stable property going forward and every one of those steps along the real estate cycle uh, or development cycle becomes a decision point too do i sell do i recapitalize do i continue to move forward so what you're saying is if you're planning out that development cycle, the EB-5 money comes in kind of stage three or four, kind of after, you know, somewhere along the lines, after a lot of the construction is done, getting close to stabilization phase. And that's when you're thinking about maybe recapitalizing your stack, getting getting out of more, more expensive opportunistic equity or, or debt at that point. That's absolutely correct. And also, too, now part of the new law, it used to be optional, but now it's a requirement on a new regional center law is that the de developers have to submit all of their, um, their basically their, their plan, as it were, in advance to U.S. immigration for pre-approval. I mean, they can start the capital raise before the government approves their, their, their deal, their project, as it were. But that still has to be submitted before you can start taking in investor money. And so U.S. immigration, because, you know, they've seen lots of bad, they've seen lots of deals go bad and investors lose their money. They're very reluctant to approve any deal that doesn't, where the land hasn't been 
purchased. It has where, you know, it hasn't been entitled. Very loath to approve a deal unless it has most, if not all of its permits already in place. And okay. so, um, and then that, so that's kind of working with, that actually works well with the investor mind, with mind frame as well. I mean, yeah, they'll approve a deal unless before, you know, ground has been broken, but yeah, they want to see the land's been purchased and entitled and permits either obtained or, or in the process of being obtained before they, 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 you know, seriously consider the project as being approvable. And you mentioned earlier a difference in the investment requirement for being in a designated high unemployment area versus being outside of one of those designated high unemployment areas. We also talked about the four seasons, unlikely for a four seasons hotel to be built in a designated high unemployment area. So how does that work? How do developers work around these rules? And yeah, so they- one thing that one thing that changed. So when that particular group uh, was going through the EB-5 process for that four seasons, the, um, the t- it's known as target employment areas or TEA for short. That's defined as an area that has an unemployment rate of 150% of the national average or a designated rural area, which is usually an area that um, has um, less than 10,000 residents as of the last census um, and is outside what's known as a metropolitan statistical area. So in those days, yeah, I mean, look at some of these projects that were out there and you're like, how in the world could this qualify as a TEA? And when Congress originally drafted the law, they allowed, they left up, they left um, the individual states could determine their own target employment areas. And so the states had every incentive to be as generous and flexible in that process as possible. So, you know, in the same way you look at some of the U.S. congressional districts that are seriously gerrymandered, I mean, you have some of the old TEA areas that were seriously gerrymandered too. And so, um, so how you know, does that situation sit today? So, the, so Congress changed the law and has des, has taken the TEA designation away from the individual states, and now rests with U.S. immigration. The uh, the details of what that will be are somewhat unclear. We have yet to be finalized, but we think that their the U.S. immigration is going to focus on to have a two census track area. So the census track in, you know, where the project's located and then, you know, some adjacent census track. And so for developers, so, you know, before you start really going down the road of EB-5 and spending money and, and brain power, the first thing that I always advise clients and prospective clients to do is basically give me the project address there's third party websites out there. That this is what they do is, you know, do T, you know, TEA, target employment area estimates. Basically type in the address and then, you know, zeroes in on the census tract, tracks to the unemployment data, and then figures out which adjacent census tracts are, are there and gives you an idea of whether or not, what, what, what level of possibility that area has as being designated as a TEA. And so, to answer your question, could you do, um, you know, a, a four seasons and still be in a TEA? The answer is quite possibly depends on what you put on it. Like, you know, for example, out here, you know, it wasn't an EB-5 project, but for example, the four seasons that's in Palo Alto off the 101 freeway is not that far from Stanford University. St- you know, full-time students for the most part are, can, are counted as unemployed. Oh, interesting. So that tends to skew the unemployment rate and something like that might qualify. Mm. Um, you know, there's pro- there's there was a whole bunch of good EB-5 projects on the western edge of downtown Los Angeles that um, it, it doesn't take that are not that far from the University of Southern California and some, um, you know, um, areas as well that do qualify. So that's always the place to start. Um, and it, it's easy to get a probably within a 90% range, well, actually probably more, probably 95 to 100% rate of certainty of whether or not the project will qualify based upon the 
um, two census track analysis and the unemployment data that's out there. That's an interesting uh, aspect that you talk about being located near a, a major university campus mm -hmm. in the designation of full-time students. Okay, so we talked a little bit about hotels and primarily because the EB-5 program is a job creation program and hospitality kind of naturally lends itself to job creation. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that. What are some of the qualifications in terms of creating jobs? How long do they have to last? Um, is there a... a, a what kind of employment do you have to create? That's a great question. So I, I'm, I referenced earlier that most EB-5 front, that well, the statistics were that most people prefer the so-called regional center EB-5 to the so-called direct EB-5. And I mentioned what, how most of these EB-5 projects in the regional center side have a construction component. And so why, why is that? And so two reasons. So if for someone who does a direct EB-5 project, let's say I try to set up a restaurant and do my own EB-5, I have to, at some point in the future, provide, I actually have to have 10 full-time U.S. workers providing their, their W-2s, their I-9s, their 1040s, you know, quarterly wage reports to show that I met that requirement. Now, that's not always as easy as it sounds. Um, you know, people provide, you know, fake social security numbers, or they, you know, fake documents. Um, you know, the, the, comp you know, the employer doesn't know that until the U.S. government checks it five years later and says, hey, guess what? You only have three qualifying employees. You need 10. Or, you know, um, so the, the people who try to do the direct EB-5 almost always constantly struggle with meeting that 10, 35 hour a week employee requirement and having them be US workers. Whereas the regional center program, it has this concept known as indirect and induced jobs. So the concept is, is that, okay, I'm building, I don't know, a hundred million dollar hotel in central Boston. Okay, once it's finished, it will have, you know, well, you know, 130, whatever, 140 full-time employees. But, you know, those, but prior to that, there's the, all the construction workers will come. The construction workers in and of themselves don't qualify as direct jobs unless it's a, a, a two-year or more construction project, which some are, some are not. But so the construction workers are seen as indirect job creation they get added to the overall job creation. And then, you know, the construction worker comes, a drywall guy comes and he works in the hotel for three months. Okay, well, what happens, you know, as well? Well, you get food trucks that come hang out at the construction site. Mm. Um, you know, the Starbucks across the street has to hire three more people to meet the demand because of the construction project. Those are called, those are known as induced jobs. So it's really just, um, you know, this whole, it's more a holistic analysis of how, of the job creation of that hotel. And so how does the U.S. government determine the overall job creation for one of these regional center projects? It's a, it's a simple input output mathematical model. There's different formulas, you know, each, each formula has its own benefits and and, and disadvantages, but essentially it's a simple input output model. I'm going to spend $100 million building a hotel in central Boston. You know, here's my budget. I'm put it in, put it in one of the systems, you know, comes out and says, okay, your hotel, $100 million hotel project will between direct, indirect, and induced jobs create 2,137 jobs. Okay. And then, you divide by 10 and say, oh, okay, well then theoretically at least we could have 212 EB-5 investors, you know, the times, whatever. But you, yeah, you obviously don't want to push it that far, but that, that job creation estimate gives you an idea of like how much you can actually realistically raise through EB-5. The number that yeah. came out at the end, you don't actually have to then go head count that. That's no, just that's a, that's a great question. So how, how does the project prove later on that those 
2,137 hypothetical jobs were created, not by going to the construction site and counting heads, that already happened, or going to the Starbucks across the street and make, hey, how many people did you hire based on the hotel? No, um, if the project said at the beginning that you know we're going to expend 100 million to build this hotel and, and putting it into the model, when they have to demonstrate this job creation, basically they have to, and this, this is a good point for developers as well, keep good records because they'll have to document that they spent 100 million or more, most likely, on qualifying construction related expenditures. So, you know, all those invoices from the drywall company, all those invoices from the, you know, the, the painters, whatever it is, that has to be proven that I actually spent 100 million or more. Then the models rerun again to prove that the model is actually correct. So what happens if for whatever reason, okay, you put 100 million into your model, but for whatever reason, you only spent 80 million of that. Okay, well, you'll rerun the model at 80 million when the time comes. And then maybe that says, okay, you only produced 1,811 jobs. That's probably okay if you don't, you know, if if you if you created enough of a job creation buffer. Basically, make a long story short, you didn't try to raise every single EB five dollar you could, yep. because you know, if twenty one hundred jobs, that's two hundred and ten investors, hundred eighteen hundred jobs, hundred and eighty investors. So basically, you'd have thirty investors in their project that would not meet the job creation requirement. Are going to be very upset mm. and we'll probably sue you in a securities class action lawsuit saying that you know whatever their allegation would be so um you never want to raise maximum eb5 dollars if for no other reason then what if you actually what if your project comes in under budget <laughs> <laughs> well that would be a surprise in these current times but I, yeah yeah that. i know i mean it's oh. more like Oh, your hundred million actually spent one hundred and fifty million. So you know, for EB five, that's a good problem to have, sort of, I guess. And when we talk about the fact that EB five is best as a late stage equity infusion, mm -hmm. does it matter when those jobs were created during the life of the project? Could you know, as long as you spent the hundred million throughout, does it matter that the EB that that equity isn't coming in until? towards the completion of construction. No, it, it does not, because that's that's the one good aspect of the EB-5 laws, that jobs created through the investment by non-EB-5 investors, the EB-5 investor gets cre cre credit for those jobs as well. So no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter as long as it's, um, you know, th through the development stage or through the construction stage. Now there has been there have been instances where projects were finished, actually finished, and then developers try to go out and raise EB five capital to pay basically to pay off their 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 bank debt or or whatever it is. Now that doesn't work because the jobs have already been created. Mm -hmm. Now I mean yeah, all your EB five money could come in you know theoretically a day before construction is completed and be fine. But then if you try to raise it a day after your, op your grand opening ceremony, you're probably that, that could be, you could be run, run the risk of running into problems with that. And so we also, we talked about when the money is best coming in, mm -hmm. how long does the money have to stay in the project? So the investor has to, this is more tied to the investor immigration requirements. So the, so EB-5 is a you know, three-step process. The investor has to, under the EB-5 law, keep their money invested at risk until at least they submit their paperwork for their third round paperwork. Now, between gov unpredictable government processing times and in the middle, there's this one two-year period from the time when there's a, a minimum of two years set by law between... Um, successful completion, actually 21 months, 21 to 24 months between successful completion of step two and when you can submit their paperwork at step three. You add all those together, it's, it's really anywhere from a five year at minimum to possibly a seven or eight year 
commitment on the investor's part. Now, previously, um, you know, the, the law was vague and, you know, as long as everything took five years, everyone was reasonably happy. But as government processing times became more erratic and longer, so well, wait a minute, like, you know, we're, we're due for an exit here. You know, it's time for us to sell. It's time for us to refi. It's time for us to do something, but we can't because we have these 85 investors in the deal. What do we do? So that issue was finally more or less reasonably resolved in this concept of EB-5 capital redeployment came in, which was much more flexible to the developers. So let's say, and you build your four seasons in, in downtown Boston, you envision it being a five-year, um, you know, hold before you sell a refi. You know, I make I'm making you an offer you can't possibly refuse. Well, under the old EB five rule, you know, you probably had to refuse it because you didn't want to uh, impact the investors. But now, under the clarified EB five capital redeployment doctrine, as long as the jobs were created, in this case, all the construction expenditure. Um, you can't have that liquidity event. So the developer can sell that hotel. Now, if the investors are not far enough along in the process, they can't receive their money back because that would, that would cancel their process. So then the developer needs to have um, a second project or alternate projects for the investor to redeploy their funds in for you know, however many additional years they have to. So what a lot of developers have been doing is like, okay, well now when it makes sense for us to sell a refi, we can do that. And okay, so of our hundred investors, 40 of them um, are not due a refund yet. So, okay, great. We have 32 million that we have to redeploy. And so we're kind of using that as like an equity, you know, to kickstart their next development project in a way. Now, you definitely want to advise developers to be careful with that. Um, you know, there has been instances where um, developers may, may allegedly have been a little aggressive in some of their redeployment schemes or investing in projects that they were significantly riskier than the investor had signed on for to begin with. You know, Basically, don't use this. Don't fall for the temptation of using redeployment funds as house money, because um, if you lose it on the second or third deal, the investors will remember that and probably come back and sue you. So, structure your redeployment. Definitely talk to knowledgeable securities counsel on best practices for for structuring your redeployment. But that is a nice feature under the kind of clarified EB five doctrine: the ability to have the liquidity event and whatever funds are still, you know, the investor has to keep at risk to use those to um, kickstart subsequent projects. And then we mentioned a couple of times regional centers. How mm -hmm. do developers find regional centers? How do they utilize them? Do they overlap? Should they be shopping around for regional centers? Uh, absolutely, yes, yes, and yes. Although there was an update today from USCIS is under their interpretation of the law, they now no longer see any of the 650 plus regional centers that exist as being valid anymore. So, which it's gonna, which was a bit of a, it doesn't, not a surprise, but a little bit of a warning, but creates significant, um, significant new dynamics. So we're waiting. So basically any of the 650 that um, wish to get in, to have to reapply. So which- How long might that restart? Well, that's, 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 that's a good question. So we're, we're waiting for clarification of, you know, can you, if you're reapplying, can you still raise money while your reapplication is pending? Hopefully that, you know, what are the details? Those are, Th those are yet to be determined, but assuming that wasn't an issue, you know, there's as of as of you know, there were 650 or so of these regional centers. Basically, a regional center was effectively a non-exclusive license granted by U.S. immigration for a group to raise EB-5 capital within certain industry 
types that they requested within certain geographical areas. And so you have some regional centers out there that are multi-state, others have much more limited geography. So, you know, prior to this recent announcement, the announcement that came out today, I would advise people, look, there's 650 of these. You could set up your own, but it's going to take time. Let's, you know, let's what's known as rent someone else's and let's shop around. Let's see who, um, you know, who has the, the area that you want, because not everyone has the same geography, who, who maybe can help you with the capital raise, and if so, like how much is that going to cost? Um, you know, what's their sort of reputational risk? Definitely shopping around um, is, is, is critical. And so I still think that will probably be important, um, but maybe now with the fact that everyone has to reapply, Maybe now some groups may wish to take this as an opportunity to set up their own from the beginning. We used to tell people before was, yeah, if your long, medium to long-term goal is to own and operate your own regional center, but you have projects you want to do now, yeah, maybe get your feet wet by working with another group, you know, do it, renting their center. Mm -hmm. And then for, you know, first couple projects while going through the process of getting your, obtaining your own, um, and then, you know, for, for future, pro for projects in the future. So going back to the original attraction for a developer and EV5 funds, that, that access to uh, lower cost capital, but what is the cost to get involved with EV5 for a developer in a project? So, you know, I mean, you know, this was, this was a big, this was, a, you know, just between you and just between the two of us and was watching, yeah, some of these firms out there, this was a massive, Money maker. It was a huge fee fest for for all parties, and you know, as more kind of service providers got involved, um, you know, the the pricing became a little more stable. In my opinion, all in and this is including the seventeen thousand seven hundred ninety five dollar processing fee that U.S. immigration charges. You should be able to set up a a, a project in the hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollar range. And, and that is irrespective of the project size? Irrespective of the project size, correct. So that's something that you definitely want to keep in mind. You probably wouldn't want to spend 125000 in document and processing fees costs to raise two and a half million of EB-5. I mean, that ratio doesn't make sense, but, you know, probably a 10 million and above, probably, probably that's where it starts making sense. Obviously, if you're raising 50 million, yeah, no, no problem. So why don't we wrap up this conversation and keep it to the developer side for this one. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any other things that you are advising your clients on today about EB-5 or any other points that uh, you think are important to make? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, since we work substantially on the investor side, for example, you know, I just got back from Dubai a week and a half ago with investors. And tomorrow morning, I'm leaving for Vietnam for a week. My schedule in Vietnam is already full of, of people to meet. People are asking me to go to India because there's so demand. If nothing else, <clears throat> the, the pandemic for the last two plus years has helped people realize that, you know, I mean, some of these countries have been under I mean, Hong Kong is still effectively under lockdown. China is still under lockdown. Like, you know, people are seeing like, wait a minute, why are, why are we living here? We're seriously considering their futures. And so the investor market, especially now that we have the regional center program back, is exceptionally strong. And so we see, um, you know, it took, it took a little bit. Of, I mean, there was a dip for a while, but now post-pandemic, post-clarified rules, it is back. Great. Brandon, thank you for, again for taking the time to chat with us today. And thank you for taking the time to view this video. You can follow Brandon on LinkedIn and through the Meyer Law Group website. Links will be included in the description below. We have a great lineup of speakers coming, including we'll do a follow-up interview with Brendan and talk about EB5 from the investor standpoint. So keep an eye out for that. So please like and subscribe below and keep an eye on this channel. Also, follow us on LinkedIn and other social media platforms. Thank you for viewing.
Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for watching.